have one fermion, I have all the numbers. And if I have a zero fermion, it's basically just like a spin system. Uh, then naturally, this wave function is independent of ordering of the both bases. So I can uh, reorder this kind of T A, T B. So here you think about it, it's a product of many tensors on each uh, side, right? So I can take any kind of ordering. I end up with the same wave function. But once uh, I have a fermion degree freedom, let's say I have one, then I have, to, in total, I have all the number of Grassmann variables. Then when I reordering this tensor here, it naturally give rise to the uh, correct sign of a fermion wave function. So actually, this is kind of tricky. It's almost like nothing. It's kind of just uh, transfer this uh, uh, kind of um, <coughs> fermion sign in the physics space into <coughs> internal space by imposing such kind of constraints. Uh, then the wave function, the particular for, uh, kind of uh, fork basis ordering has been specified in the ordering of all these uh, Grassmann tensor T. If we reordering them in different way, you get a different sign. Okay. But uh, uh, I also want to emphasize uh, you know, to make this trick, this uh, 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 kind of metric must be put in the very front. So that's the rule. That's actually the rule of the Grassmann <coughs> algebra. This uh, kind of D theta in the very front, and then the theta uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the right side. And finally, you integral over this uh, uh, Grassmann variable, you just get a complex number. And uh, on the other side, I also want to comment this kind of assignment is very natural because uh, if we think about uh, a Fermion system in quantum field theory, we're familiar that uh, it can be described by this so-called Grassmann pass integral. So here, it's actually just a kind of uh, wave function point of view of this Grassmann pass integral. Because uh, uh, tensor network, in some general sense, you can think about uh, the configuration space of the tensor network is equivalent to some partition function of a one-dimensional system. So in a Bolanic case, you can map to a one plus one D Bolanic system. But in a Fermat system, you can map to some one plus one D Fermat system. So it's nothing strange that we impose this Grassmann algebra here. Uh, OK, so now we want to uh, 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 discuss the, what's the power of this uh, Grassmann tensor network. And uh, over the last five years, we actually find that uh, uh, similar to this uh, Bolanic system. By using this so-called Grassmann tensor network, we can further classify this uh, non chiral topological orders uh, in, in quite Fermat system. And uh, uh, we hope this classification may be uh, even complete for all these non chiral topological orders. And the recent de development by the group uh, of Nick Reed and Serac, they also showed us the uh, hope even for chiral topological order, like a fractional quantum cross state. And also, for this so-called uh, symmetry protected topological order, based on this uh, Grassmann <coughs> tensor product state representation, we can even develop some new mathematics called a super cohomology class to completely classify this uh, uh, 2 plus 1 DSPT state. Okay. Uh, so uh, before going to some numerical example, I also want to briefly uh, sketch this uh, uh, algorithm. So uh, excuse me, so uh, what's the total? Wow. You have one dollar. Uh, one more hour. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, then I can go more detail. So, uh, uh, um, when we want to do some variational calculation, uh, typically it's very hard if we have like a very large boundary dimension or internal dimension for the tensor. So, and also, uh, I will mention later, because uh, the ground energy of a tensor network state cannot be computed <coughs> exactly. It must always with some error. So this variational calculation turns out to be very inefficient if we want to minimize the energy. Unless we can design this tensor in some correct way, a uh, very clever way. Otherwise, you always uh, suffer with about this uh, resonance between truncation error and the unphysical minimum. So instead, we want to use some different way to find the ground state, the so-called imagined time evolution. So the idea is actually uh, pretty like this uh, uh, projective Monte Carlo method. Um, idea is that uh, you just uh, starting from some random initialized state and you just apply in this uh, uh, you just apply in this uh, projection
Yeah, so it's a pretty simple uh, concept. If we apply this uh, uh, projection for enough long time, I uh, suppose that we can get this uh, kind of, uh, at least we can get a local minimum uh, for, uh, for the ground wave function. So, um, so that's basically the idea of this so-called imaginary time evolution for tensor network state. So here, uh, I'm also showing you this example on this uh, honeycomb lattice. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the tech technique actually related to something so-called a uh, short expansion, kind of uh, suppose this Hamiltonian can be decomposed into three pieces. So A, B, C just means the local Hamiltonian on three uh, directions. We have assumed it's a nearest neighbor, so to be uh, simple. So we have HA on this link, and HB on this link, and HC on this link. But uh, uh, typically they are not a commute. But if we think about uh, uh, this kind of beta, if we can divide it into many, um, many kind of small time slices. So typically this can be equivalent to write it as like uh, some delta for H. <coughs> we apply uh, many, many steps. So, so this n could be large. Typically, in your working calculations, like uh, you're running for millions of this uh, uh, iteration. So, uh, uh, if if delta power is extremely small, uh, then this non-commuting part uh, typically on the order of delta power square. So you can just ignore that. Uh, so uh, then, when we doing this kind of imaginary time evolution on this uh, honeycomb lattice, we can just uh, uh, separate doing this uh, uh, three pieces of Hamiltonian. So, so for example, for this nearest neighbor. We can do all the horizontal direction on this bound, so they kind of uh, decouple. You can sim simultaneously apply this uh, HA on all the horizontal bound, and then the next step you rotate, you apply HB and uh, then HC. Then you just uh, do this uh, iteratively, and in the end you will uh, uh, have some conver converged kind of uh, ground states. Uh, okay, so so this kind of imaginary time evolution idea, uh, it's. Uh, uh, Pretty uh, straightforward and uh, uh, also related to this the path integral idea of the uh, Fermion system. Basically, you can think about this imaginary time evolution. It's just like uh, uh, some uh, imaginary time uh, path integral. <coughs> so, um, to perform s such kind of uh, uh, technique, we need to go to something called a coherent uh, uh, representation. Coherent state representation. Basically, we also replace this Fermat operator, this C dagger here, into some uh, uh, Grassmann variable. Yeah, so in the previous uh, kind of uh, slides, I mentioned that uh, this wave function can be kind of defined on any kind of fork basis, uh, and uh, the fork basis ordering is uh, <coughs> uh, co uh, there's corresponding ordering <coughs> in all this tensor T. So, so basically, this is a wave function uh, in front of this kind of fork basis. Then actually, you can you can you can uh, uh, group this uh, kind of uh, C dagger operator together with the corresponding local tensor. And uh, you put them together, it's always Fermat number even. Then the, the, the whole thing, you can, you can, you can order, order them in arbitrary way. There's no additional sign. So, so that's the idea in this imaginary time evolution. So if you, put a, if you think about this tensor as a whole thing, so this kind of T tilde tensor is uh, always commute with each other because uh, uh, the total parity <coughs> is always even. Then we can do something uh, local update. So the uh, local update basically uh, just uh, you write down this Hamiltonian action in the Fermat coherent state representation. So it's just like uh, usual quantum circuits in this Fermat coherent representation. But uh, you put this delta power very small, and this Hij just one particular kind of direction, let's say on the horizontal direction. Uh, okay. Then you get some matrix element E here, let's say, uh, uh, with some kind of uh, Grassmann basis. You, you kind of, this circuit, you can act on this original tensor network. Then you get some flattened uh, uh, tensor uh, along this uh, x direction. But then you want to do a truncate. So the uh, truncate, there's a simple way we call the simple ablate. Just put some weight to mimic this environment con contribution. But uh, there could be more complicated one, like you can put uh, some uh, kind of uh, so-called cluster, you can make a, 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 a approximation for this environment by some <coughs> small cluster of tensor network. But uh, there are all kind of uh, improvements. But here I just show some uh, very simple way. So, so in 
uh, all the calculations I presented today, I just use, use this so-called sim property. Just put some lambda weight. So initialize it, uh, you can just put all everything lambda to be one. Uh, then uh, here, you, you get some flattened kind of uh, tensor here. But then you can do uh, some single value decomposition. Uh, although these uh, tensor, they take a grassland value, but you can imagine that uh, you can still perform some thing like a single value decomposition, just uh, you have a two Fermi parity channel. So you, in, the, uh, in the even channel, in the other channel, you have two different matrix. Okay. And you just uh, keep this leading, leading eigenvalues in uh, both channels. And then you can reduce this uh, kind of a flattened tensor into this uh, normal one. Uh, okay, so this is the kind of last step. And then you get uh, some new lambda prime. And then you uh, uh, do it along B direction or along C direction. But uh, after this one kind of uh, circle, you update all these lambda. So the lambda you obtained uh, in this step can be served as an environment for the next step. So uh, that's the uh, uh, Recipe. And here I just want to show that uh, compared to this usual Bolanic system, there could be uh, uh, some very interesting signs. So you can just uh, maybe 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 check later that uh, uh, the this sign actually comes from the reordering of all these uh, graphs and variable. When you act in this kind of uh, uh, local circuits on the tensor network, you want to interpret out this <coughs> kind of uh, eta, this uh, coherent uh, uh, state basis as well. Then you re reordering all these. Uh, 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 Grassmann variable, and you get a complicated sign. But uh, but it's it's uh, compared to the boson, it's uh, completely the same. Just uh, have this uh, some additional sign. And uh, finally, you can determine this updated uh, tensor also with some interesting uh, sign. But uh, without uh, in addition to that, uh, there's nothing uh, new than this uh, bosonic uh, system tensor network problem. Okay. So uh, once we have a, a ground wave function obtained from such kind of so-called imaginary time evolution, we can measure its uh, uh, two ground energy, and as well as other correlation functions we are interested in. So um, uh, I also just want to briefly uh, tell you the idea how to perform this. Uh, because of time limitation, I will, uh, the main time I will just represent this uh, um, results. But the idea actually is uh, uh, kind of uh, simple because uh, uh, if we want to calculate this physical measurement of grounds and the energy force is uh, typically very, very hard. The reason is that, uh, for example, if we want to ca calculate the norm of the wave function, just a norm, just uh, the simplest thing, uh, it's already corresponding to some double tensor, right? So psi is one layer, so psi dagger is another layer. So the norm you trace over this physical degree prism. So it would, you end up with something called, some called a double tensor. And double tensor will have a dimension d squared. And if, if we want to brute force it, uh, kind of uh, uh, trace this double tensor turns out to be uh, sharp p hat, because you can, if you use the transform matrix method that you cut here, you have some exponentially large dimension. Mm -hmm. And a similar thing also happened for the physical uh, quantity, like uh, ground energy. For example, you have a kind of two-body Hamiltonian. And you can just put some operator in between. Uh, of this two physical degree with them. But uh, you end up with some, just uh, some tensor network with some impurity tensor here. But uh, the cost basically also uh, sharp she hard. It's the same as the norm. So uh, there are some more rigorous proof by people doing quantum information. This cannot be solved. It's almost like uh, even harder than NP hard. It's something called sharp she hard. I, I, I don't know what it means. So anyway, it's, it's, it's hard. So, <laughs> so the, uh, how to uh, solve this hard problem? So the idea is that uh, for uh, uh, people doing physics, we want to al always think about this so-called cost screening picture. We think about uh, this hard because we want to keep track of all this uh, information at a short distance. But if we want to get, get rid of it, just want to have some information at a long wavelength or fixed point, then maybe it's not so hard. So that's the basic idea. Uh, uh, so in practical, basically you can just think about uh, for this double tensor network, you glue certain tensor together, get a new one. But uh, if you do this in a naive way, you think about after one step, you glue this uh, two levels together, you get uh, some dimension d to force, force. And then you do more and more, it just exponentially become exponentially harder again. You want to do this exactly. So the key step is that uh, you want to make some truncation. So have some local tensor uh, uh, mimic this kind of tensor in some best way uh, from the physical point of view. We call it keep the long range entanglement, but uh, get rid of the short range. But from numerical point of view, you just want to uh, kind of choose some different tensor, but keep uh, 
the physical quantity, for example, the norm or the Brownian wave uh, energy, as accurate as possible to make the best approximation to this side. Right? So that's the numerical purpose. Uh, so there are some uh, simple algorithms uh, we found, but uh, uh, I don't have time to uh, list the, all these uh, recently developed algorithms. But uh, there's a room to improve this uh, in future. So I, I just uh, um, kind of uh, uh, give you some flavor what's, uh, uh, what's the idea of, of these algorithms. So the idea is that uh, we want to deform this kind of network. For example, starting from square lattice, then we deform into some so-called uh, uh, octagon lattice. So the idea is that uh, we want to uh, express this kind of uh, uh, rank four tensor into some sum over of this rank three tensor. Because if we, wa we want to do the previous kind of uh, uh, step uh, in, uh, directly, it's very hard because uh, you want to find the best approximation for this tensor for this, it's, uh, it's typically really hard uh, nonlinear equation. But in this kind of uh, scheme, you find that actually all the algorithms based on some linear algorithm, uh, uh, precisely the simplest way, just a so called single validity composition. Because uh, uh, if you want to decompose this rank 4 tensor into some of, uh, summation of two rank 3 tensors, uh, uh, the best. Uh, uh, thing you can think about just the, the so-called singular value decomposition because you can think about uh, this uh, rank four tensor like uh, <laughs> matrix if you glue this uh, uh, right hand down and the left hand up so it's just like a row and put put them off a matrix and then you do a singular value decomposition you can you can keep the uh, leading eigenvalue and you uh, approximate this uh, uh, in a best way locally but of course uh, uh, this kind of cost function is not the most general cost function that uh, uh, to uh, kind of uh, optimize the global trace because global trace the uh, other tensor can contribute some uh, important weight and with lots of weight sometimes we call the environment and uh, uh, then this uh, cost function can be uh, changed and uh, like for some channel of the tensor you got the important and some not so important but uh, in some simple way just like time evolution you can also put some weight but in more complicated way there are some more even fancy things um, so after this uh, step, the second step is actually very simple. Just uh, like a brute force is sum over all these internal degree freedom, then you get some cost bring the tensor. Right? So this cost bring the tensor, you have a total vortex, uh, total size already <coughs> reduced by half. And then you can do this again and again if you can finally uh, uh, get the physical quantity you want to compute. And uh, recently, uh, there were a lot of uh, devel development. But uh, uh, all these kind of uh, Method share some uh, share the same idea that they want to keep this uh, so-called Lagrange entanglement. So the test for this kind of algorithm is that you just put the so-called uh, fixed point string and uh, wave function inside of this algorithm. If there is no truncation error, then this this kind of method in principle they can capture this Lagrange entanglement. So this uh, simple SVD is one such kind of simplest algorithm that capture the Lagrange entanglement. But there are uh, even more uh, advanced methods, so-called uh, second renormalization by uh, Tao Xiang, and also we also develop some so-called wave function renormalization. Basically, do some single layer renormalization scheme can uh, make a much efficient uh, uh, algorithm. And also, there could be potential Mankalo um, uh, and a tensor renormalization mixture algorithm developed by uh, Lin Wang. And so far. Uh, uh, for this, uh, if we have enough computational resource, if we can do, uh, distribute all the calculation to many CPU, turns out that this method is the best one because it's easy to be parallelized, and uh, other methods are very hard to be parallelized. Uh, okay, so uh, now I, I want to turn to this uh, uh, Fermanic uh, case, and uh, uh, it turns out uh, the basic idea is pretty the same, but uh, again, just you want to think about uh, this tensor contain two channels. So for example, if you do this singular value decomposition, so on the high kind of lattice we want to do in this, we, we first have this two rank tensor, rank three <coughs> tensor glue together to be a rank four, and then we then decompose in the other way. Then we make it some truncation here. So here all the tensor already, they are double tensor. I'm always talking about the double tensor in this uh, computation. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the additional thing uh, for a Fermat system? It's actually it's nothing than uh, uh, Z2 symmetry. So you can think about uh, this red line is kind of uh, Fermat parity odd, and uh, this uh, black line Fermat parity even. And then when you're doing this kind of uh, uh, so-called singular value decomposition, this matrix always have a block that diagonalized form. It's 
just like have a C2 symmetry. Uh, then uh, uh, after you do this, do, do, do this kind of decomposition, you keep this uh, uh, two channel in the in the new time set, and uh, similar for the other cases. So uh, and uh, the second step, when you want to kind of uh, 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 kind of shrink uh, this uh, uh, um, small triangle and uh, and uh, get a cross grain the tensor, uh, there could be some additional frame assigned due, due to this kind of reordering. So the scheme on the Hunt lattice is slightly different from the square lattice. You kind of uh, do uh, such kind of uh, uh, move by using this so-called sing singular lattice decomposition. So you change this kind of uh, uh, local pair into such kind of local pair. And then this becomes the Hunt triangular lattice. And then you sum over the group and you get uh, back to the Hunt lattice. So that's just due to the geometric reason to choose a different uh, recipe. So, uh, uh, so Basically, uh, uh, this method can be applied to all the lattice, like uh, Kagomi and the Triangle, all these interested uh, translational invariant lattice. Uh, okay, so so now uh, let me just show you some uh, physical results. So uh, first, we just apply this method to a very simple fermion system. Namely, uh, this fermion system basically uh, just a, a superconductor. It's a S wave, S wave superconductor. And uh, <coughs> if the chemical potential is uh, very large, basically the, in the ground state, there's no fermion at all, so it's uh, completely trivial. But it's not very large, if you, have, you can create some fermion. Um, so we do this kind of uh, imaginary time evolution just with the minimal dimension. So because uh, for fermion system, we at least have D equal to 2. We have one photonic channel, one fermion channel. And then we just do imaginary time evolution computer energy and compare to the uh, exact solution, uh, we find a pretty good fit. And also, you, you, you see, when you compute the ground state energy, uh, this uh, kind of uh, truncation error is pretty small. So you, you take a decut cut this uh, singular value you want to keep. Plenty of settings are already planned. Uh, and the, the ground state energy compared to true ground state energy, the error is like uh, uh, around the, uh, uh, like 0.4%, so, so it's not very big. Uh, but if we don't go to a critical system, for, for example, if we tune this mu to zero, because the mu equal to zero uh, Hamiltonian is the same as the uh, uh, graphing Hamiltonian because you can do particle hole transformation on the B side and then this become a Hawking Hamiltonian, right? So it's <coughs> a Dirac fermion. And uh, if we have a Dirac fermion Hamiltonian, it turns out to be uh, not so simple because uh, if we just take D equal to two, we find ground state energy pretty higher than the true ground state. But if we take D equal to four, it's uh, get a much better improvement. But uh, meanwhile, we also see that uh, to get a Converge the ground state energy, we take this uh, D cut to be much larger, almost around the 6k to 8k, to get converged ground state energy. So at the beginning, before it's converging, you see ground state energy even lower than the true ground state energy, which is uh, apparently <coughs> wrong because uh, no nothing can below the true ground state energy. Um, <coughs> so uh, our uh, kind of experience is that for gravity system, this uh, method converged pretty well. But for a gapless system, you need to typically enlarge this D cut or use some more advanced method to uh, get a high precision. So, uh, now? Sorry. Okay. Well, that's for that uh, sort of indication that the measuring time evolution is not really variational. Uh, no, no, no. The time evolution is variational. But uh, when you compute this, uh, uh, when you compute this uh, ground state energy, you can, uh, you make an error just because, uh, because the Time evolution and the uh, computer ground state energy, they are separate steps. First, you have time evolution, you already have some approximate ground state, but then you want to compute the ground state energy for that state. But if you, uh, precision is not enough, you just uh, get a wrong energy, which just means uh, this is not a true energy for the corresponding tensor. You need to put it enough bigger to get a corresponding tensor. Yeah, but this does not uh, mean the method is not a variation. It's always a variation. If you can keep, uh, keep a decode to go to infinite, my claim is that uh, Nothing can below the true ground energy. Um, so now that, uh, let us uh, uh, test some slightly challenging model, so the interacting model. <coughs> so here we have some kind of spinless uh, fermion, but with the uh, nearest neighbor attractive interaction. So from some kind of basis theory argument, we know it's, uh, it must be a P plus IP uh, superconductor because the claim is that for any spinless fermion, if you have attractive interaction, it's always uh, uh, have a P plus IP pairing. So now we just uh, randomly initialize this uh, tensor and do imaginary time evolution, and then we measure the ground state energy and uh, this uh, superconducting order parameter. 
And it turns out that this quantum energy is pretty close to the exact diagonalization, but of course it's not uh, uh, as good as the free fragment. So slightly uh, around like 1% quantum energy uh, error for these points. But again, we don't push the limit because in principle we can keep a D to 14, but uh, this is just a test, we don't want to push, push the limit. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it gives rise to the correct phase. Because if we measure this uh, uh, superconducting pattern, it is uh, uh, have a two pi of three twist. So this is like a magic. You kind of uh, randomly initialize your uh, tensor. And you just put some ch chemical potential in the Hamiltonian to control the total Fermat density. So I choose <coughs> just a different Fermat density. And then you just uh, compute this uh, phase shift of the uh, superconducting order parameter. You see it's very precise, uh, two pi over three for these kind of different electron densities. So it, in this sense, it gives rise to the correct phase of this model. Right? Although the ground energy to d equals six is not uh, high enough, but uh, if we go to d equals 14, it's going to be uh, below uh, on the order of like uh, 0.1, 0.2%, pretty good. Uh, okay, so with, with this kind of tests, we can try to uh, 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 kind of uh, um, move to this uh, more challenging problem, namely this uh, uh, Hubble model in the infinite U limit or finite U limit. Uh, so we first look at this infinite U limit. Uh, so, so can you compare the delta U, uh, U, U tens uh, to the EDU delta? Uh, in the EDU, you cannot uh, compute this delta because it's too small. There's no delta you can, you can get. Yeah, yeah. Just 24 signs. Yeah, you can only compare ground energy. From the ED, there's no way to get a, a superconducting state on this very small size. Because it's, uh, you, uh, from ED, you want to compute this uh, ODL out, this off for the long range order, you don't need to go to the larger system size. <coughs> but uh, uh, in this kind of uh, wave function, the reason we can get this delta is because uh, it's a thermodynamic limit to ansatz. So the ansatz itself is for infinite size. So it's, it's a spontaneous break of this U1 symmetry. So you just compute this average of delta is now managed. But in ED, you compute the average of delta, delta is always there. You can only compute this uh, ODL and R. Uh, so the result for this infinite you have the model turns out uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so this uh, green line is a benchmark for the Nagoka state. So up to 20%, all the states we find actually below this uh, uh, Nagoka state uh, energy. And also, we benchmark this ground energy with the DMRG on some finite cluster. So, this method, the DMRG, is the exact method on small cluster. <coughs> so, we find a systematic consistency uh, with the DMRG result. But uh, they are below this uh, Nagoka state uh, ground energy, which uh, have a hint that the Nagoka state is actually unstable in this case. But uh, when we compute this polarization, pretty interesting, it's uh, similar to this uh, square, that is like uh, up to 20%. Uh, looks like the polarization almost max, maximum. So that's what, the reason why on um, square that is uh, uh, stable chaos and claim is the uh, Nagoka state, because uh, uh, if you just compute this uh, polarization, it's almost 100%. Uh, but uh, but uh, in DMRG or in, in this 1D system, it's really hard to compute this uh, uh, superconducting order primary. So um, it's not clear on the square that is there's also a P plus IP superconductor or not, but uh, at least uh, in the high con that is we can make a uh, definite uh, uh, con uh, conclusion. So, so the uh, result from this uh, uh, magnetization and the ground energy is that uh, uh, it's a pretty interesting state. It's almost uh, fully polarized. Actually, if we carefully ex extract this polarization by numerical data, it's almost around like 99%. Uh, just a very small deviation from, from the fully polarized state. But uh, of course, it's not the uh, Nagoka state it's because uh, for the prior state, it's a free fermion. We, uh, it's the Aiken state of the Hamiltonian. We can compute the energy exactly. But uh, we find that the ground state energy always below that exact energy. Um, so we, we also compute this so called uh, superconducting order parameter. So here we find it's uh, pretty similar to this, uh, uh, the spinless fermion model I presented uh, uh, before. Uh, that, uh, this uh, uh, superconducting order parameter in the singlet channel is always zero, vanished. So in the triplet channel, uh, we can make a, uh, so this delta t actually is the norm of the D vector because triplet channel we have three components. So delta t just a measure, uh, uh, so here delta t just a, just a norm, uh, yeah, just a absolute value.